We turn to drugs because we're trapped. We turn to drugs and alcohol seeking an escape from the hell that the white man has trapped us in here in America. We are trapped. We know no way out. So we get a wine bottle. We get a whiskey bottle. Or we stick a needle in our arm. Or we smoke pot. Trying to find an escape from the hell that the white man has given us for 400 years here in America. So this is a false escape. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad is offering a real escape. A, not, not only a, a real estate, but a real escape right here on this earth. We declare our right on this earth to be a man, to be a human being, to be respected as a human being, to be given the rights of a human being in this society, on this earth, in this day, which we intend to bring into existence by any means necessary. We're loving people. We love everybody who loves us. But we don't love anybody who doesn't love us. We're nonviolent with people who are nonviolent with us. But we are not nonviolent with anyone who is violent with us. Then uh, I referred to the popular belief that the Muslims preach a hatred for the white race. You do not subscribe to this. Then. No, uh, I've never heard Muhammad teach or preach hatred for anyone. He, he preaches hatred against evil, against drunkenness, against dope addiction, against poverty, and against uh, having to beg for the things that a man is supposed to have. Uh, but I've never heard, uh, heard him teach us or any of his followers hatred toward any human being. Well, the moment you've been waiting for has come. The person you wanted to hear most is here. I, uh, I told uh, Minister Farrakhan that normally when I walk around this institution, people say, oh, here's the president. Today I walk around, nobody even recognized me. <laughs> they said, where's Minister Farrakhan? Where's Minister Farrakhan? I told them it wasn't nice to come in here and take over my institution like this. <laughs> but uh, Minister Farrakhan is welcome here with all of his, his people, and they become our people, part of our family here today. As I said earlier, this is Malcolm X College, it's family home, and anyone who comes here is welcome and a member of this family. As you know, when you introduce somebody, you're always given something to introduce them with and by. But as I looked at it, what it did was tell me some of the things the minister has done. It didn't tell me who he was, who he is. And I can't tell you that. I think what we'll do is let him tell you that. But there's one thing I know, is that he's a man of courage. And he believes in what he says. And he calls it the truth. And each of us has our truth. You have yours, I have mine. But each of us may not have the courage to speak that truth. And when someone does, that is a person I respect. I 
hope today the courage of Malcolm X College is recognized. All of you in this room. Because today we have the courage to have a program that exemplifies the respect we have for ourselves and the dignity that we can express by being willing to do what we know is right. And so today, as I said earlier, is a special day at Malcolm X College. It's our Malcolm X College Family Day. It's 25 years since Malcolm X was physically removed from our presence. But it's a day in which we all come home. And so, at this time, I'm going to let the man who rode in the car that sits out in our, in our lobby with Malcolm X, the man who studied under him, the man who followed him in New York at Temple Number 7, I'm going to introduce to you the man of the hour, Minister Louis Farrakhan. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, the Creator of all things, the Revealer of all truth, the Sender of all prophets, we thank Allah for giving us Moses and the Torah or the Old Testament. We thank Allah for giving us Jesus and the Gospel or the New Testament. We thank Allah for giving us Muhammad and the Quran. Peace be upon all of these worthy servants of God. I thank Allah for raising in our midst a divine leader, teacher, and guide who is teaching us the wisdom of the Torah, the Gospel, and the Quran as they relate to a plan of salvation for the black man and woman of America, for all oppressed people on this earth, and for the total human family. I'm very happy and honored to greet all of you, my dear brothers and sisters, with the greeting words of peace. In the Arabic language, we say, Assalamu Alaikum. And to those of you who are unfamiliar with those words, they mean in English, peace be unto you. To Dr. Milton Brown, to the Malcolm X College family, To the honorees who are on the rostrum this afternoon, to the media, and to all those who are present, I call it a great honor and a great challenge to be here this afternoon on this occasion. Twenty-five years ago, at around this very hour, Malcolm X was assassinated in the Audubon Ballroom as he was addressing between four and five hundred of his followers. On that day, Malcolm X, for some reason, did not permit a search. 
And on that day, some black men got into the Audubon Ballroom with sawed-off shotguns and pistols and ended the life, the physical life of Malcolm X. I know exactly where I was on that day. I was teaching across the river in Newark, New Jersey at the local mosque there when we received the news. The tragedy of that afternoon and the subsequent pain to Malcolm's family and to those who loved him and to the membership of the Nation of Islam who had fallen away from Malcolm has produced pain in all of us who are involved in the struggle of justice for our people. A pain that lingers to this very moment. It is a pain that is carried by Betty Shabazz, his wife, by Attila Shabazz and Kubila and Ilyasa, and I think there's one more child, but I knew those three. And that pain extends to all of those who admire Malcolm, who love Malcolm, who were inspired by Malcolm. And we lost him as we did Dr. King at such a young age. Today, 25 years later, with less emotion, we might be able to assess this tragic loss and draw lessons from it that perhaps we can heal the wounds and write a new history and go on after learning the lessons to the liberation that Malcolm talked about that Martin talked and dreamed about and that liberation struggle that we gathered here today are alive either to be a part of as an active participant or be some wayfarer on the road watching the struggle for our own liberation. The media is here because it's an interesting development. Farrakhan at Malcolm X College. <laughs> On the 25th anniversary of his assassination. What will Farrakhan say? <laughs> How will he present the case, or his case, or our case? Will he say anything that we can use to keep the controversy going? Will he make a mistake in an emotional tirade and say that which will allow us to continue to pour salt in a gaping wound in a too wounded community that cries out for healing? I came to Malcolm X because to me it's 
the place I should be today. I came to Malcolm X because looking back 25 years, one should be wiser than one was 25 years ago. One should be able to see clearer because hindsight, they say, is 2020 vision. And most of us who live life, in our youth we do things that when we mature, we wouldn't do. And in our youth, we say things that when we mature, we wouldn't say. But as we were honest in what we said and what we did when we did it, as we mature, we ought to be honest in what we say and what we do when we do it. We are all growing, we are all evolving. Hopefully, we are not today what we were yesterday and we are not tomorrow yet what we shall be, but we are an evolving people. And the struggle for liberation is a struggle that is making us wiser with every step that we take. And in our sojourn toward liberation, there are casualties along the way, there are conflicts along the way, there are deaths and assassinations along the way, there's ignorance along the way, but at some point we have to look back with a cold eye and reason where we went wrong, how we went wrong, what did we say, what did we do, because today we face the same enemy that Malcolm faced 25 years ago. <laughs> Only the enemy is wiser today and more wicked today, even as we hopefully are wiser today in our struggle. I want to talk about history since this is Black History Month and why we should look at history and study the history that Malcolm X made for there are lessons in his history that will fit us out with an armor that will make us able to go through the 1990s into the 21st century or the 20th, 21st century, pardon me. Wise people study history. Because if you don't know what was, you can't understand what is. And you're ill prepared for what is yet to come. So wise people study history because it is cyclical in nature. For history is the recorded deeds of men and women and nations as they struggle against impediments in our evolutionary march toward the absolute. Now, as students of history, we must understand that there is a reward for our research if we are wise enough to be attracted to this most attractive study. I remember in 1961, Malcolm X talked with the great brother who wrote the book Roots, Alex Haley. And Alex Haley, writing for Reader's Digest, interviewed the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X. And they said to Alex Haley that some of our original fathers 
who were brought into America were in fact Muslims. And that the slave masters who historically had come into contact with the Muslims as Islam spread over the known world from the 7th to the 11th centuries and black men rose to power in Islam. And since these blacks who were Muslims were conquering armies of white folk, when the new world was established, they did not want any Islam taught to black people or to white people even though the founding fathers were Muslim shriners meaning that they had 33 degrees of the circle of knowledge you have to appreciate that context in order to understand the profound effect that Malcolm X had on the black struggle as a Muslim. All right? The slave masters understand that when your life is committed to God and you fear God and God alone and you worship God and God alone, you cannot enslave a person of that kind of mentality for any long period of time. Our fathers were not the buffoons and clowns that they would like us to believe. For we could not have taught them how to cook and to sew. We could not have built their fine homes if we were such clowns in Africa. They took wise people out of Africa. They took mathematicians such as were great builders. But they did not want that knowledge passed on to the young because parents' greatest function is to pass on the history, oral or written, the language, the accomplishments to a young generation so that young people will be inspired by knowing what their fathers did so that they can build on what their fathers did and build greater than what their fathers did. But the slave masters did not warn us with that kind of knowledge. They didn't want the slave children to hear the Mu'eddin call out Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. God is great. God is great. So I couldn't hear nobody pray because anybody that was found saying the name Allah would be killed because they did not want that knowledge transmitted. They did not want our own traditional African religion transmitted. They did not want the culture of Africa, the drum of Africa, the music, the dance of Africa transmitted. And so we have grown up, even though we are an African people, we have grown up totally divorced from that culture, from those traditions. Whether it is Islamic or whether it is the traditional religions of Africa, they wanted no touch of Africa in the children. And so couldn't hear nobody pray. Mama gone, father gone, a motherless child sees a hard time. So the slave masters reared our fathers by telling us lies. We found you in the jungle with bones in your nose. You never were nothing, you can't be nothing. You ought to be glad that we found you jungle bunnies 
and civilized you. This was done to our babies so that we would grow up having eyes but not being able to see, having ears but not being able to hear, having a tongue but not being able to speak, crippled mentally but out of our genetic past. Messages would keep coming up into the black psyche. And we would bring out of our genetic coding some of the mastery and the genius of our African history and we would display that genius in this society robbed of our inventions robbed of our creative genius robbed of the ability to read to know but yet our fathers knew and so we didn't have any means of transmitting messages so we sang them white folk love to hear us sing and so we sang for them swing low sweet chariot coming to carry me home well I looked over Jordan and what did I see was a band of angels coming after who? Me. Coming to carry me home. See, we knew that this was not home. This was a strange land. And we were living among strange people whose customs were strange, whose habits were strange, whose mind was strange. Yeah. I'm laying a foundation for Malcolm a foundation for Elijah a foundation for Farrakhan a foundation for Hannibal Afrique and us we didn't just come into existence we were brought into existence by an immutable law that whenever a people are deprived of that which God has ordained for us out of our longing for that which we have been deprived of that longing is passed on in the genes and someday a woman gives birth to a child and it is an ordinary looking child but an extraordinary child Nat Turner was a man like that Denmark Vesey was a man like that Gabriel Prosser was a man like that Booker T was a man like that W.E.B. Du Bois was a man like that Frederick Douglass was a man like that Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman were women like that. Ida B. Wells was a woman like that. We don't just pop up. We're not a toaster. We don't just pop out. People that don't compromise don't pop up. People that won't bow down don't pop up. What pops up is that which you put down and it pops up. But these that are made out of that law, they can't compromise because they speak for the dead that cannot speak. They speak for the present generation that is voiceless and they speak for the unborn generations yet to come and when such ones appear the slave masters are upset yes, sir. you can understand that can't you a slave master wouldn't go through the trouble of making slaves 
and not be troubled by those that come out of our longing to alleviate the pain and the oppression of slavery. Well, you know and I know, my dear Christian brothers and sisters, that white folk didn't let us read the Bible. They used to keep the Bible locked. Did you know that? For over 300 years, they didn't let us read the Bible. So we didn't know what Jesus said, what Moses said. But, In 1790, they saw that it wasn't incompatible for us to be slaves and Christians. Not from the teachings of Jesus, but from their warped idea of how to use religion to come into the very religious nature of black people and deceive us in the very nature of our love for God. Oh, I want you to listen to me. Because, thank you, the deceit has been going on so much and it's going on at this very moment. But I thank Almighty God, Allah, that He's made some of us wise enough to see into the words and the actions of the deceiver that we might pull the coat of our brothers and sisters that we don't fall victim today to what we fell victim to in times gone by let's listen they gave us religion we never met Jesus. We never met Peter or Paul. We met the slave master. He was our first brush with our so-called Christian. No wonder we sang the song, everybody talking about him ain't going there. <laughs> he is a man depriving us of everything talking about heaven right. talking about the love of Jesus Christ and pure hatred was our diet every day well you can understand then that Christianity as given to us by our slave master, not the teachings of Jesus Christ. And there is a difference. They gave us religion not to bring us close to Jesus, but to make us better tools of service for them. So that when they released us from one kind of bondage, we would be locked up in a more subtle but more deadly kind of bondage. Y'all all right? I'm not going to be long. You say, well, what does this have to do with Malcolm X? It's the background. It's like the props that you put on the stage before the principal party walks on. It helps you to understand him in his relationship to the scene. This is not pop-up happenings. Brothers and sisters, the church has been that which comforted us through slavery. The church has been the bedrock of our experience it has been the place that we could meet and organize and some of our greatest leaders have been from the religious experience because by nature we are a religious people. Malcolm X 
grew up with a father who was a Baptist preacher. But he wasn't an ordinary preacher. He was a Baptist preacher who had a brush with the Honorable Marcus Garvey. And when he met the teaching of Marcus Garvey, he became a revolutionary kind of preacher. No man who met Mr. Garvey could have a child that was not touched by the majesty of Marcus Garvey. My mother was on the fringe of Marcus Garvey even as Malcolm's mother was on the fringe of Garvey. Malcolm's mother from the Caribbean, my mom from the Caribbean. Malcolm saw his father killed as a young boy. Malcolm, like most of these young men, you're brilliant, but you don't have any way to express what you are so that the world may see you as you are and not as the world paints us to be. These young men who are in Malcolm X College have at least one leg up on a future. But Malcolm went to school, the public school. We call it the killing fields. <laughs> well, why would you say that? As much as your people need education. Yes, we need education, but we need the right kind of education. And I respectfully submit to you that 100 years after they let us in church and let us in their schools, look at the condition of our people. You can tell a tree by the fruit it bears. If we had a good education, if the religion had gone deep into us as Jesus would have intended it to be, we would have been a better, more moral acting people today. Talk to me. And if the education were a proper education, we would be a more productive people today. Is that right? But the education wasn't designed to make us productive. And this is why we have to be careful about the American educational system. It is a killing field for young black men and women who aspire to great deeds, but particularly the black men. Malcolm, when he reached the eighth grade, he was showing promise, brilliance, like you, like some of those that are in Cook County Jail today or Joliet or Marion, Illinois or some of those that are dead in all of these cemeteries that we went to school with and knew they were smarter than we were but all of a sudden they're gone now I was not the smartest man in my class I was mediocre and I'm willing to bet that most of you that are leading today you were not the best in your class you were mediocre, but what happened to the top of the class? It's gone, it's dead, it's in jail, it's on drugs, it's destroyed. We that got through, we're more submissive. We submitted to our teachers and we let them bend us and mold us and the more we looked like we accepted the bending and the molding, they applauded us, they patted us on the back, they gave us a star on the forehead, they gave us a passing grade. So you become the first Negro 
to do this or the first Negro to do that or the first Negro on Channel 5 or the first Negro on Channel 7 or the first Negro. Before the struggle in the 60s, there were no black anchor men or anchor women nowhere in America. You got your position on the backs of those who struggled, who lived, and who died, and now you got to pay that debt back to your community. It was the young brothers who didn't have any education that threw the Molotov cocktail and made Chicago hot, made Detroit hot, made Watts hot, made Harlem hot, made Huff and Cleveland hot. And white folks didn't want to go where the heat was, so they had to grab some of you Negroes off of the black newspapers and black radio stations and send you into the ghetto to talk to your people. So don't you ever forget it. You owe a debt to black people. And it's right that you honor Malcolm. Not come here to see if I say anything that your editors can use against the struggle of black people but you go back and you fight like hell to see that the piece that they put on the news tonight is worthy of your presence The genius of Malcolm X is really the genius of black people. But we are like undeveloped seeds that never germinate, that never blossom, that never grow, that never take root. Malcolm and you and us and we come up like that. In the eighth grade, Malcolm was asked by his eighth grade teacher, what do you want to become when you grow up, Malcolm? <laughs> Teachers like to know what students aspire to so that they can either cultivate them toward that noble objective or crush them so that they never reach it. I'll let you decide which they have done. Malcolm said, I want to be a lawyer. He had the gift of speech. He knew he could handle it. But listen to the words of the teacher. The teacher said, oh Malcolm, <laughs> if you became a lawyer, your own people would not hire you because your own people don't think that much of black lawyers and certainly my people would not hire you but Malcolm you would make a wonderful carpenter <laughs> that is sticking a needle in the brain of a bright child, a brilliant child. And that's why I appeal to us as mothers and fathers, if you have to send your children into these killing fields, take some time at night when they come home and debrief them. And then put the right thing
in. I had a mother like that. She was black, black, black. And she taught me to love black. And my beautiful black mother would tell me, boy, in her beautiful West Indian accent, boy, I don't ever want to hear you say that Pledge of Allegiance like they say. You hear me, boy? I say, yes, ma'am. She had a very strong right hand. <laughs> she said, now here's the way I want you to say this thing. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation. They didn't say under God then. And they were right to say that. And if they say it now, it's hypocritical but I will repeat it as you say it now. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for white. And remember this, every time you say it, when you get to that last line, say liberty and justice for white people. Because there ain't no liberty and there ain't no justice in this country for black people. You understand that boy? Now my mother, my mother was on the fringe of Marcus Garvey, but my father was a Garveyite. So I couldn't grow up in this society without the touch of Mr. Garvey. In my soul, in my mind, in my spirit. Malcolm grew up in Lansing, Michigan, Omaha, Nebraska. I grew up in Boston, Massachusetts. My teacher asked me in the sixth grade, and what do you want to become, Lewis, when you grow up? I never will forget her. Wonderful Irish lady. I said, I would like to be a doctor because I really hated to see people suffering and sick and I wanted to heal people. And she looked at me and said, Lewis, <laughs> why if you became a doctor, your own people would not come to you and my people would never let you practice medicine on them. Lewis, you play the violin beautifully. <laughs> I'm just telling you the truth. Now you ask your children, how come your little black boys, they show so much promise at four and five and six and show so much brilliance at two and three, but after a few years in the school, you don't see that brilliance anymore. <laughs> Malcolm said, if I can't be a lawyer, to hell with it. And he walked out of school in the eighth grade and started getting into trouble, like many of our brothers and sisters do. He was brilliant, he became a little hustler. He used to use dope, sell dope, like who? Like most young people that don't have a job, Malcolm learned how to hustle. He knew that white men like black women, not because they love you. They wanted to share the black experience. <laughs> Sorry about that, but that's just the truth. <laughs> and if you doubt what I'm saying, ask any white lover that you have, does he love your black father? 
And does he love your black brother? See, it's easy to romance you in the dark, in the corner, around the, you know, the pillar there. But if they don't love the tree that produce you as a fruit, then there ain't no love there. It's a desire to have you. But let's get off of that subject. <laughs> Malcolm used to bring black women up to Harlem and white men up to Harlem for black women. He hustled. He pimped. He sold drugs. He put a gun on his hip. He went to rob it. Like many of our young people. He had a criminal record. Like many of our young people. What I'm trying to tell you is, genius is in the jails. Some of the best of us is behind bars with a criminal record and the criminal record don't tell you who these young people are. It tells you what white folk have made them in a world that is adverse to them. Now to the whites in the audience, please don't get uptight. Please don't be upset. You see, the scripture says God made man. Didn't say God made nigga. God made man. Then somebody else made a nigga. And the nigga is the product of the workings of this social, political, economic, religious, and judicial order. We didn't make ourselves like this, so we are your product. So if you don't like what you made, then look in the mirror and see your own bestiality. Malcolm went to jail. He was arrested in Massachusetts. He went to Norfolk Correctional Institution. He was given approximately 15 years. And during that time, one of Malcolm's brothers, who was a follower of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, brought the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to Malcolm in prison. When Malcolm heard the teachings, it is just as the Malcolm X choir sang today, a change came. And the angels will have to say my name. Were no angels talking about Malcolm Little because a change hadn't come over Mr. Little. But when Malcolm heard that word of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, it so inspired him that he took on the virtue of learning. Malcolm went to the prison library and Malcolm started with the dictionary. And he read the dictionary from cover to cover. And anybody that has ever talked to Malcolm or debated Malcolm knew that Malcolm not only knew words, but he knew philology, he knew etymology, even though he only went to the eighth grade of school. This is to show you that these buildings are fine, but if they don't work, you don't have to cry because they don't want you in their college. You don't have to cry because you're not in their school, but there's books. Everything you want to learn is in a book, and if you got the right books, and you got the right mind and the right spirit and the right will. You can read a book and run college graduates clean off the earth with what you know. Yeah. Now, don't say that I'm down in college education. Don't do that. 
We're in Malcolm X College. I couldn't be talking like that. <laughs> but look how many people are here. And look how many people are out there who never get the chance to see in here and think that because they don't have what it takes to get in here that they got to go through their life ignorant. That is a fallacious statement. And it is wrong thinking and the lessons that we want to draw from Malcolm's life. The first lesson is that a building don't make you wise. All right. He read the dictionary. And after he had a grip on the dictionary, he studied everything of history he could get his hands on. I am about eight or nine years his junior. So while Malcolm was in prison, I was going to high school <clears throat> and then to prep school. But there's something about my life that I want to express this afternoon. From the time that I can remember myself, I was always concerned about black people. My mom had a tremendous impact on me. The Garvey tradition had an impact on me. And the first book that my mother gave me to read was the Crisis Magazine, in which were some of the writings of W.E.B. Du Bois. I don't mock the NAACP. I know the value of that. Even though I may disagree with their methodology, I cannot condemn a bridge that helped me to get over. We've got to be a bigger people than that. Because the struggle of the NAACP made it better for many of us even though we never had a membership in that organization because it ne wasn't necessarily our cup of tea probably. Right. The Urban League has had its profound effect, its good effect. Well, as I would read as a young boy, I would cry over the suffering of black people. And I seemed to have a keen sense of what is just. And I would ask my Sunday school teacher, if God could send these men to deliver Israel and all of these other people, is there not somebody to deliver us? She would say, Jesus. But Jesus was too far away from us because it seems as though they had put him out in space somewhere. And Jesus' representatives were the one giving us total hell on the earth. And if we were going to get free, it seemed like we had to get free from these pseudo representatives of a precious and beautiful Jesus Christ. I'm trying to give you a few parallels here. I did not know as I was growing and yearning to see black people free. I told my mother, I said, Mom, I'm going south to college. She said, why do you want to go down there? I said, because I want to experience what my brothers and sisters are experiencing there. I want to experience it for myself. I graduated high school at 16. I was a track star, but the coaches in the South felt that I was a little young and even though I was running the 100 at 10 flat and 9-9, then at 16, they said if I seasoned one more year, I would be a stronger athlete in the South. So I went away to prep school. And at 17, 
I started my journey south. I didn't have to go too far. I just went to Washington, D.C. There was an eight-hour stopover. I got off the train, and I wanted to take in a movie since I had eight hours. And there in the Capitol, I went to the movie theater. My mom had given me some money. I took out a crisp $20 bill, plunked it down. People were staring at me with these horrible stares. I thought maybe I might have been unzipped or something, so I checked myself out. I, I seemed to be all right. When I got to the window, a man came up to me and said, I'm very sorry. We don't sell tickets to Negroes. I was stunned. I had the $20 bill in one hand, the wallet in the other. And I'm walking down the street <laughs> in a daze. I had never experienced that before. A friend of mine had just gotten killed in Korea, dying for a freedom that we don't have. See, all of this is fuel for me. You all want to know why I am the way I am today? <laughs> You could say a label made in America. <laughs> There's no compromise in me. I can't compromise the destiny of a people. I can't crawl on my knees to Bush or nobody else in power. I have to stand up or die because it's bigger than me it's bigger than you it's what's behind us that brought us to where we are and it's in what's in front of us that is a part of us and so I went south in North Carolina I was on the highway one day and I wanted to use a restroom. They said, go in the courthouse. Surely I could get justice there. <laughs> I went in the courthouse and they took me into a sub basement. There's a basement, then there's a basement under the basement. <laughs> And in that basement, under the basement, there was a toilet. One for men and one for women, but there was no door on the women's toilet. So women had to gather around women so that they could go to the toilet without being seen. This is the way segregation was. I went to church. I didn't want to go to the black church. I knew I was accepted there. I wanted to test the white church. They told me I could come in, but I had to sit in the balcony. Couldn't sit on the main floor with the true followers of Jesus. <laughs> then in some churches, I couldn't even get in at all. But the difference between Farrakhan or Lewis Walcott as I was then was that I could not suffer that without saying something. My whole life, go back and check my record. I have never bothered anyone, but any injustice that I saw, I had the courage to speak against it. And even though my own peers thought I was crazy because I saw preachers go into bed with little girls in the college giving them AIDS and in that time it was before Brown versus the Board of Education black teachers were teaching black people and as a 17-year-old boy, I said, how in the world can these teachers teach our children 
when they actually had sex to get grades and were passed. I said, this is a travesty. This is a crime against our people. And I spoke against it on my college campus. Go check my record. I wanted to be an Omega, but I only got as far as a lamp because they blackballed me or whiteballed me, which is a better term. Well, after that, buddy, I was looking for change. And that's how I met Malcolm X. I was playing in a nightclub in Boston. And they told me that this man, Malcolm, was tearing up Boston talking about white folks. And nobody could talk about white folks like Malcolm X. Don't take my word for it, go get his tape. That's why I think there's a lot of deceit in this so-called romance with Malcolm. They have another purpose in mind, which I'll get to that in a few minutes. I'm not going to be any much, much longer. But I thought I needed to lay this kind of foundation so you could see, in a sense, my perspective of where my brother was coming from and where I'm coming from. When I first met Malcolm, he had on a brown tam, a brown coat, brown suit, brown gloves, an imposing man. And I heard he was talking so bad about white folks, I was scared of him. <laughs> so when I shook his hand, I shook his hand quick, and I ran into a little chicken shack called the Chicken Lane in Boston and got away from Malcolm. I didn't know I was running to Malcolm. So I was playing in Chicago, right here, on the north side, in a nightclub, on Rush Street, called the Blue Angel. It's not there anymore, but I was the headline attraction at the Blue Angel, and one of my friends said, hey, Elijah Muhammad is speaking. I had heard of this man. I was looking for somebody that would speak liberation. So when I went to the little temple, at 5335 South Greenwood Avenue, I heard the man that I believe I was looking for all the days of my life. And when I heard him, it was instant love. It's like a woman that you've been dreaming about. <laughs> and you can't put your hand on what she looked like, but you know what she's going to do for you when you meet her. You understand that experience? And when you meet the woman, you see her face, you see her smile, you hear her words, your friends say, what happened to you? It was love at first sight. Well, that's the way it was with Brother Farrakhan and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I left Chicago and I went to New York and went to Temple Number 7 and heard Malcolm X for the first time. And I'm saying to you, I have never heard a black man in my life talk to way, the way this brother talked. I joined the mosque immediately. <clears throat> I was a, a man in show business. Malcolm came and broke the news to me. I had to either get out of the mosque or get out of music. Because Mr. Muhammad didn't want me doing both. I said, wow. And I quit my music. And Malcolm was my teacher. The lesson I'm trying to tell you, the brother can't be reduced to a slogan by any means necessary. You can't reduce Martin Luther King to I have a dream. This is the way they present our great ones to us. They collapse them into a convenient phrase. But if you are not intelligent enough to look 
behind the phrase to learn the man, the mind, the spirit, then you don't really know the man and you're living just 25 years after the man and have a very weak or shallow knowledge of the man. You're just a few years from Dr. King and know very little about the man. Because these men who give you Malcolm, who give you Martin, they don't want you to continue their struggle. So you end up with a picture of the man on your wall, but you're not struggling the way he struggled. You're not living the life the way he lived it. You don't know nothing about that man's life. So you say, Malcolm is my man. Fine. Then dig into the man. He inspired me. I have to tell the truth. He inspired me. He taught me how to become a man. I always wanted to be a man. I didn't have any father. Malcolm became the father that I never had even though he was nine years my senior. I submitted to my teacher and I drank in everything that he said and I walked with Malcolm as he went back to Harvard a few blocks from where he was arrested and I saw him debate the best that colleges in America could produce and nobody could handle Malcolm. He had a brilliant mind. He was disciplined. If you could accept the discipline that Malcolm imposed upon himself, we would be a better people today. I never saw Malcolm smoke. I never saw Malcolm take a drink. I never saw Malcolm eat in between meals. He ate one meal a day. He got up five o'clock in the morning to say his prayers. Huh? I never saw Malcolm late for an appointment. I never heard Malcolm cuss. I never saw Malcolm wink at a woman. Now it seems to me that if you're going to love a man and you're going to fall in love with his wisdom, you ought to start building the character as the support for that wisdom. Huh? Listen. Malcolm was like a clock. Whenever he had an appointment, I would watch it. He would drive up just about a minute before the time. All right. And he'd be walking in 15 seconds before the time. And when he sat down at the table in the restaurant meeting, whoever he was to meet, it was right on the, mo on the money. He was disciplined. He was punctual. He was courageous. He was intelligent. He was a tactical man. A man who tactically planned moves to advance the cause of black people. I adored Malcolm. I want you to listen to me good. Why did you adore him, Farrakhan? I adored him because to me, the greatest man in my life, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, has been and is the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And the way Malcolm represented the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, there was not another minister, captain, nobody in the nation that I saw representing the Honorable Elijah Muhammad like him. So because of my love for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, I adored Malcolm because Malcolm was his greatest helper. From my vantage point. Now there would come a time, and I got to get into this critical point. Malcolm 
is like any of us. A man worked hard. He wanted to be respected and loved for his work. How many of you are in some organization and work hard and it looks like the people that are in the organization with you don't seem to appreciate your value? You know that among us, one of our greatest drawbacks is not blackness, it is ignorance that manifests itself in cold, naked envy. Envy. Jealousy. And let me tell you something. When people are envious of you, they will work night and day to destroy you. Envy is an irredeemable characteristic. It makes you like a Satan. You smile, but you don't mean it. You sit down at the table of somebody that you envy, but you're plotting against them all the while. That is in every organization. It's right here at Malcolm X College. Is that right? You don't have to bear me witness. I know it's here because black folk are here. The human condition is here. I ain't asking you to tell me nothing. I already know. If you sing too good, somebody gonna hate your voice. If you play basketball too good, if you come here in less than a year and have done a heck of a job, somebody don't like the job you're doing and trying to undermine. I know our people. Well, if that is in us, it had to have existed in the nation of Islam. And in the nation, Malcolm worked hard, but there were those in the leadership who were envious and jealous of Malcolm. And as Malcolm worked, people spoke against him. And Malcolm, really in his pain, we were like father and son, so he would come and talk to me. And I would always encourage him spiritually. Malcolm was more the political man. Louis Farrakhan was more the spiritual man. In a magazine recently called Emerge, they were comparing Brother Malcolm with Brother Farrakhan. You can't make any comparison like that. Because I am who and what I am. And Malcolm is who and what he is. The circumstances that made Malcolm may be similar, but we're not the same people. We don't have the same footprint, the same fingerprint. We don't have the same mother and father, but we came up under the same general conditions. I am more spiritual. Malcolm was more political. We need both spiritual, political, economic, social, educator, and we need the warrior. Right. You understand? Those who don't have nothing in their heart but slay the enemy. You got that among the people. We need it all. But there would come a time when Brother Malcolm and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad would be at variance. And that was the most painful time of my life when I had to choose between the man I have looked for all my life, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and the man who helped to shape me, Malcolm X. And I say this to every mother and father that's in here. You don't realize the pain in your children when you contemplate divorce. And when children love a mother and love a father, one of the most traumatic things in a child's life is to have to choose between two people whom they love. And if you go on one side, it's like you betrayed the other. And if you take mom's side against dad, dad don't like it. If you take dad's side against mom, mom don't like it. It's a heck of a thing. Well, that came into the nation. But it didn't just come. 
You've got to understand, and I know that those who speak are Malcolm will bring it out. The FBI, the counterintelligence program of the United States government. I want to warn you, brothers and sisters, I know the hour is late, but don't you ever forget the role that the hidden hand of the U.S. government played in the destruction of black organizations and black leaders. Don't ever forget this. In the documents of the Freedom of Information Act of the Nation of Islam, they will tell you that J. Edgar Hoover worked night and day through agent provocateurs inside the nation to create a split between Malcolm X and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And Malcolm fought against it. I have heard Malcolm on numerous occasions as the press began to build Malcolm up as the real leader of the nation of Islam. Malcolm would stand up and very vehemently say, there's only one leader, and that's the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. But what was the press doing? The press was building Malcolm and playing down his teacher. Malcolm was out there building his teacher and playing down himself. Listen to this. Do you know in any organization when there's a charismatic leader that the followers love? If the press tries to make a secondary leader equal to or greater than the primary leader, they incite the positive jealousy in the followers for their leader. So in order to protect their allegiance to their leader, you create a situation where those followers will deny the secondary leader for the first leader. I mean, it's all a psychological game. And you got to understand that you're not dealing with a, with an, uh, a, a, a present day warrior that don't have a long history of how to deal with people's minds and mess you up. They created a negative environment right inside the nation around Malcolm X by projecting Malcolm as the leader over his leader. Now, Elijah Muhammad, whom the press would like to say, and the Muslims, kill Malcolm. Look at that. Elijah Muhammad, they said, had Malcolm assassinated. They don't prove nothing. They say it long enough so that it will be believed. When Kennedy was assassinated, Elijah Muhammad told all of us as his ministers, make no statement with respect to the death of the president. Malcolm had been beating John Kennedy to death all that year. When Malcolm, you go back and get his speeches, when he called him John F, he said the F stands for the fox. John the fox, you the chickens. And he's eating you up. If you go back and listen to Malcolm's speeches, in 63, he was categorically and chronologically showing the deceit of the Kennedy administration in their work to stop the rise of black people. Any historian will bear me witness that this is what Malcolm was doing. When Elijah Muhammad said, don't make any statement, Malcolm X in fact, Elijah Muhammad was supposed to speak December the 6th in New York City, but after the president was assassinated, Elijah Muhammad canceled the speech 
and the Malcolm X came to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and said, Dear Apostle, we have put so much money out, it, we don't think it would be wise to cancel the speech. May I speak in your place? Elijah Muhammad said, go right ahead, brother, but remember, don't make any statement with respect to the president. Malcolm got through the lecture. Beautifully. But a man from the New York Times, his name is Handler, came in the meeting and Malcolm's captain, his name is Yusuf Shah, put the man out. And when Malcolm heard that the New York Times reporter was put out, he told Yusuf, go get him and bring him back. And that man sat in the audience. And after Malcolm finished his lecture, somebody got up and asked him about the assassination of the president. And Malcolm said, well, I don't cry when chickens come home to roost. I'm kind of happy when chickens come home to roost. Malcolm organized the uprising in the United Nations when Lumumba was killed. And Malcolm knew that the government had a part in the killing of Patrice Lumumba. Malcolm knew that the government had murdered many revolutionary leaders around the country. So when he said it's a case of the chickens coming home to roost, his statement was correct. However, he had disobeyed. Not only was his statement correct, but Muslims now, who don't carry any weapons, we out there in the street with our papers, the country at that time adored Kennedy. Can you imagine the shock of Kennedy being assassinated? He with little Jackie by his side. And Jackie trying to get out of the open top car. And the brain of her husband is almost in her lap. Imagine the shock of a nation. Look at John Kennedy looking back and see the majesty of that young man, the youngest of the presidents, and how he had captured the mind of America, black and white. So when Malcolm spoke like that, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad silenced him for 90 days. Now, to many who are outside the nation, and you have your view, and your view is your perception, but we have ours, and you never really have heard our view. See, but Brother Malcolm, his teacher loved him, extraordinarily so. And to protect Malcolm, silence him. Don't let him go in the public and speak. Because if he goes in the public, maybe he would have been assassinated because of the love that people had for John Kennedy. So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad gave him 90 days to be silent. But already Malcolm was beginning to feel that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was envious of his popularity and success. It's true. And when Malcolm was set down, silenced, I was the brother that was sent to New York to speak in Malcolm's place. It is like I have been right up under Malcolm since I became a Muslim. And when Malcolm was silenced, it was Louis X that was called. And that night Malcolm came and got me. After I spoke, and we went home and had dinner together. And it was at the table that night that Malcolm broke the story to me of the wives of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And he didn't say to me, young girlfriend, he knew the language to use because the language is in the Bible 
and in the Quran. He said, wives. He said, what do you think, Lewis? I said, well, I was really stunned, shocked. I said, well, I think that there's no God but Allah. That's all I could say, and Muhammad is his messenger. And Malcolm took me to the airport, and I got on a flight and drove, I mean, got back to Boston. The next morning, 5 a.m., Malcolm called. I to he told me on the way to the airport, he said, now don't tell anybody what I said. What I've told you. And I said, well, no, I'm not going to tell anybody but the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. <laughs> and 5 a.m. the next morning, he called me. And he said, Brother Lewis, I would like you to give me some time and allow me to write the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and explain. I said, well, brother, I said, what you told me got my mind so messed up. It's going to take me some time to frame the letter. <laughs> so if you can get your letter off in that time, that's good. I said, I don't want to be caught in between two powerful men. He said, well, brother, he said, there's only one powerful man. I said, well, brother, you're right. I couldn't sleep that night. And the next morning, I got up and I opened this book, Quran. And it just so happened that it opened to the 33rd chapter of the Quran, which talks about the wives of the Prophet. And to any Muslim that's in this audience, the Christian scholars have called Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, a voluptuary, an immoral, decadent kind of man. This is what Christian missionaries have said of Prophet Muhammad because he had nine wives. But they don't say that of Abraham. Abraham is called the father of the righteous and is recognized as that by Jews, Christians, and Muslims. But Abraham had more than one wife. Talk to me. Moses had more than one wife, but yet he's the liberation figure for Israel. David had more than one wife, and David is the prototype of Jesus Christ. Solomon, the wisest man in the Bible, not only had wives, but they say he had concubines. Now listen. Listen. In the prophetic history, if you don't understand how this applies, then you can misapply it and make a mess of your life and the lives of women. I got back on the plane, went over to Malcolm in that very car that's out there. We sat in that car. I said, Malcolm, I just read this in the paper. I mean, in the Quran. And Malcolm said, I know it. He said, but you can't handle that. You let me handle it. I will defend the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, but you can't handle it. The last conversation I had with Malcolm X, he was about to leave the nation. And in that same car, out there, we sat in front of his home in Long Island. And Malcolm looked at me and said these words. He said, brother, I wish that it was you being an example for me rather than me being an example for you. I'm here today to say to all of you, he died. In a sense that I might live. I didn't know what he was talking about. He would be an example for me. I never knew that I would walk right up in Malcolm's shoes. And I understand what Malcolm went through inside the nation because I went through the same thing. 
I became Elijah Muhammad's national spokesman. I came to New York. I didn't want New York, but I was moved to New York. I lived in the same house that they firebombed Malcolm in. I walked the streets of Harlem at a time when black people in Harlem hated Muslims because they believed that Muslims had killed Malcolm X. I started my talk on that day in the Audubon Ballroom. One man was captured at the scene, though there were many who were there. Malcolm's home was firebombed seven days before. Malcolm went to the police and asked for police protection. But on the day Malcolm X was killed, there wasn't one uniformed policeman nowhere in the Audubon Ballroom and scarcely around the ballroom. And somebody went to the brother and said, don't search because that searching offends people. And that day Malcolm did not search. And his murderers got in and ended his life. Malcolm went to Egypt. Read his autobiography. He was poisoned in Egypt. The nation of Islam didn't follow him to Egypt. Malcolm said before he died, my assassination is bigger than the nation of Islam. Listen to me carefully. When he landed at the Gaulle airport in France, he was supposed to speak there. They wouldn't let him in the country because they did not want Malcolm killed on French soil. The nation of Islam was not in France. He's firebombed now, asking for protection, and there is none. Remember now, the FBI got their people in among us posing as Muslims. And they got people in on Malcolm's side like they got people today in the nation and they got people among Waratuddin posing as followers of his. They got people with you Hannibal. They got people everywhere today listening. It's not an accident that we are here today. I know I've been long. Forgive me. Forgive me. Please forgive me. But I want to end this at this point. But I don't want to leave unsaid what needs to be said. Many of us as Muslims disliked Malcolm when he spoke against Elijah Muhammad. And I was one of those. I can't lie or hide the truth. I was one of those that took a strong position against Malcolm. I was hurt that he came out against his teacher. And being a lover of Elijah Muhammad, I spoke ill of Malcolm X. I was one of those who spoke into the illness that Malcolm himself created when he left the movement and spoke against Elijah Muhammad who had become an institution. So I spoke against Malcolm, Malcolm spoke against Elijah Muhammad, Malcolm's devotees spoke against Elijah Muhammad. We spoke against them, creating the atmosphere into which Malcolm could be assassinated. We were all pawns used. Our own sincerity and our ignorance being used by a wicked government who wanted Malcolm dead but wanted to blame on Elijah Muhammad so they could kill two birds with one stone. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, two innocent men have done 26 years in prison for a crime that they did not commit. They've taken lie detector tests on television 
and all of their lie detector tests have passed but the government wanted it to stick that the nation killed Malcolm but I say this to you on the television to Bush to the government you know your bloody hand in this black folk were used but you were behind the scene calling the shots Malcolm is dead but yet he lives the person that was involved in the killing later on named everyone that was involved in the killing with him and attorney consular having the information trying to get the government to reopen the case so that two innocent men who lost their wives and their families so that the lie of the government could stick they would not reopen the case and Malcolm's murderers walk the street today why didn't the government want to reopen the case don't you want justice could it be that some of those who pulled the trigger were agent provocateurs, agents of the government? Like the agent that was giving him mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation while he lay dying on the ballroom floor. It was a government agent breathing into him, hastening his death. They want us to believe that James Earl Ray killed Martin Luther King. But look at the similar circumstances. Taking away police protection that was loyal and faithful to Dr. King and putting people around that didn't care two cents for him. And confusion, confusion after the fact of the death. That's how you hide murder. You create the confusion so that people don't know who did what, so they can't properly attack the people who actually did it. But now, as I conclude, dear brothers and sisters, I want you to know that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad put Malcolm's picture before me. And he said, study this. Well, I didn't understand why he was telling me to study it. Malcolm on one hand says, I wish it was you being an example for me rather than my being an example for you. Then Elijah Muhammad saying, study this. I didn't know what the future was going to bring. But now I, the little boy, growing up now in the movement, becoming more powerful, more known, and some of my own brothers beginning to envy me and hate the fact that the people were responding to me. And they began to speak ill words. But I begin to think, mm, I wonder, is the Honorable Elijah Muhammad behind this? I began to think, just like Malcolm thought, I'm just telling you, I walked in the brother's shoes. I know those shoes. I live that life. I don't talk about a man from the outside in. I talk about him from the inside out. I understand why he did what he did. I don't have time to go into it today, but I know that God has given me that bomb that would heal the wound because I've lived the life. The laborers of Elijah Muhammad became so envious. They began to say little things like Farrakhan was going to be an enemy of Elijah Muhammad and he would make what Malcolm did look like child's play. 
And as they began to say this, hate was building for me inside the movement among the top leadership. And I went to Elijah Muhammad one day, ready to have it out at the table with the top uh, laborers. And Elijah Muhammad, when he heard me say envy, he hit the table. And he said, brother, seek refuge in Allah from the envier when he envies. And he walked out of the room. He came back five minutes later, and these are the words he said. He said, Brother Farrakhan, when you're going to put a piece of board in the corner of a building to uphold the weight of the building, you got to put a lot of stress on it. And if it cracks under the weight, then you know that's not the board you were looking for. You throw it away and get you another one. I didn't fully understand that, but looking back, I understand. Malcolm was to be the heir apparent. Do you realize that in order to stand up over you and lead you, a man gotta love you more than you hate yourself? Do you know that to lead you you will become envious. You will work against your own leaders. You will throw stumbling blocks in their path. And if the leader can't take it and sidestep it and love you and still reach for you, then the leader will be overcome by you. You burn out all your leaders. You burn them out and you bury them. You put the weight on their shoulders and when they die, you say, I told you the nigga couldn't carry the weight. <laughs> you are not an easy people to lead. But if the leader don't love you, he will abandon you. And I'm saying this in my conclusion, don't leave. In my conclusion, the government knew Malcolm's success ratio among the masses. And when Malcolm was assassinated, the press gloated. Am I lying? Right. They were happy. Right. The man that lived by violence died the same way. They mocked his death. They didn't love Malcolm yesterday, and they don't love Malcolm today. Anytime you hear them talking about Malcolm, I'm telling you, look beyond what they say and look at what their purpose is and I would like to tell you what their purpose is. See, Malcolm is ours. We don't need no cracker to tell us how to honor our own hero. I'm telling this to you white folk, we don't need your damn talk to tell us how to honor our heroes. hypocrites some of these Jewish writers gonna no listen to me talking about Malcolm as though you love Malcolm Malcolm called you the devil and even when Malcolm went to Mecca and had a change of heart do you really think he changed and if you couldn't forgive Jesse Jackson for a Jaime remark, we would be a damn fool to think you would forgive Malcolm X for what he said. These people hate Elijah Muhammad and they hate the truth that inspired a Malcolm. Malcolm inspired a whole nation to move. There would be no Kwame Ture if there were no Malcolm X. There would be no James Baldwin 
writing fire next time. There would be no Lewis Lomax when the word is given. There would be no John Henry Clark in the way that John Henry Clark is and even Ben Yakinen in the way he is unless there was a Malcolm X to inspire them with the word that he got from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. There would be nobody saying black and calling each other brother and sister. That was started and popularized by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad through Malcolm X. It was a single-handed job. While everybody else was turning the other cheek. Malcolm said no. Malcolm said an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, and a life for a life. You don't want nobody to say that, lying hypocrites. <laughs> Talking about how Mandela, how they love Mandela. Mandela hasn't given up armed resistance. Mandela knew and knows today that if they don't move, there's only one way. We either fight and die or get fight and get free. We don't have no other alternative if a government won't yield to legitimate demand and protest. And this hypocrite Bush going to invite Mandela to the White House, leaving one White House, inviting him to another White House. I bet you Bush would never invite Malcolm X to the White House. Hypocrites. you're doing what you're doing so let me tell you why you're doing what you're doing you saw that after Malcolm was assassinated you didn't get the results that you thought you wanted us to kill each other so you could cancel out the nation of Islam on one side Malcolm on the other but it didn't happen that way so you wanted to try and build a cadre to come against the nation. So you took Malcolm's autobiography, knowing that in the end Malcolm was angry with his teacher and condemned his teacher. And you made Malcolm's autobiography required reading. You never did make E.B. Du Bois's or Marcus Garvey's writings required. Why Malcolm? Come on and talk to me. You made Malcolm's autobiography required reading because you saw, you know medicine. If you want to keep people from being affected by a plague that's coming, you take the ingredient that's in the plague and you inoculate the subject with it. So that when the plague comes, you built an immunity and a resistance against the plague that's coming. You know that black people are going to rise up. Nothing, there's no power in the heavens above or in the earth beneath that will stop your rise, brothers and sisters. But they got to do what they got to do, and we got to do what we got to do. So when they spread Malcolm's autobiography, all they did was create a band of revolutionaries. You think they love Malcolm? When Malcolm left the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, before Malcolm could get his movement off the ground, Malcolm was dead, but 
the truth that Malcolm spoke had captured the hearts of the young. And the Panther Party was born out of Malcolm's resistance. Young black men who said by any means necessary. Young black men who studied the writings of revolutionary leaders and said power grows out of the barrel of a gun, so they picked up the gun. Let me see if they love Malcolm X. These are Malcolm's children. Huey Newton was Malcolm's child. Eldridge Cleaver was Malcolm's child. Fred Hampton and Mark Clark were Malcolm's children. How the hell you gonna tell me you love the father and kill the children of the father? You don't love no Malcolm X. But you would raise Malcolm in order to raise an army of black people around the charismatic personality of Malcolm. But you would like to direct that energy against another force that you fear. Eldridge Cleaver was Malcolm's child. Fred Hampton and Mark Clark were Malcolm's children. How the hell you gonna tell me you love the father and kill the children of the father? You don't love no Malcolm X. But you would raise Malcolm in order to raise an army of black people around the charismatic personality of Malcolm. But you would like to direct that energy against another force that you fear. So today, I am alive because my brother, my teacher, died that I might live. I didn't understand it, but I understand it now, and because I understand, I'm responsible for my understanding. There would come a time in the movement when I would disagree with Imam Waratuddin Muhammad. There would come a time that I would walk away from him as Malcolm had to walk away from Elijah Muhammad. And if I didn't have that example, I wouldn't know how to do it. I walked away and I was quiet. Because what it to deem was an institution. You don't buck institutions. You have to deal wisely with institutions. My brother died. that I might live. I watched his life and I looked at his chest displayed on the cover of Life magazine with all these little holes in his chest. And the doctors when they opened him up said he had the cleanest insides of any man they had ever seen because for the 13 years that he followed the Honorable Elijah Muhammad no smoking, no drinking, no swine flesh he ate clean, he lived clean therefore his insides were clean listen I knew that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had put a message in me. The revolution can't survive if the revolutionary is killed. So the revolutionary has to be wise to avoid the killing fields. Not for the sake that he wants to live, but that the revolution may live and thrive. So revolutionaries have to be wise. Not only courageous, but wise. So I never attacked Imam Waratuddin. 
I disagreed and went on about my business. And when I looked innocuous and harmless, for seven long years, I was working underground. The press said I carried away 10,000 followers. That's a lie. That's right. That's right. I had nobody but myself and the brother who woke me up, two of us. And we decided to rebuild the work of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And then Malcolm's life meant more to me than at any other time because now I knew what he meant by example. And so, brothers and sisters, I tried to avoid that trap not only once, but I avoided it twice. And by God's grace, I hope to avoid it the third time. The second time I avoided the trap was when I stood with Reverend Jackson, a Muslim standing with a Christian. Had never happened before. The disciple of Martin King standing with the disciple of Elijah Muhammad for a purpose bigger than both of us. And when they saw me playing a subordinate role to my brother, whom I felt then was a gift of God to us in a very critical hour in 1983 when Jesse said he wanted to run. And when we stood with Jesse, the same forces that went to work to split Eldridge Cleaver from Huey Newton to split Malcolm from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Split us. They were at work again to split this brotherhood that had captured the imagination of black people, Jesse Jackson and Louis Farrakhan. So they brought up some of the language of the 60s of Elijah Muhammad that I spoke. And they threw it into the campaign. And as I began to defend Jesse Jackson. And the FOI came around Jesse to give their lives. To protect his wife and his children. When the Jewish Defense League said they were marching on Jesse's house. We went to his house. And the brothers stayed in day. Then the Secret Service didn't like that. That Jesse had his own black secret service. <laughs> and so they called me the new black Hitler. <laughs> like I have some wicked vendetta against Jewish people. That hurts me. I'm not that. I don't have any thought in my mind of harming Jewish men, women, and children. But look at the seed this planet. If you tell young Jews that here's a new Hitler coming, if you were Jewish, how would you take that? Do you think young Jews want to repeat the horrors of the Holocaust? No! So in the heart of young Jews, the seed of murder is planted for Farrakhan. But they don't want to kill me direct. They're trying now to get me into prison. But hey, that's like putting a rabbit in a briar patch. <laughs> All my brothers are in prison. Muslims are growing up in prison. I would be in heaven in prison. So how do we kill Farrakhan? How do we stop it? But they don't know that. They have to try. 
I've sat down in my home with highly influential Jewish rabbis. With sincere, frank dialogue. They ain't gonna come out and tell you. And nor do they let their knowledge of that kind of thing filter down to the rank and file Jews. So everywhere I go, there's a Jewish protest and they say Farrakhan started the controversy. I don't say nothing. <laughs> I go to deliver a speech. You whoop up the people with the press. Farrakhan's a bigot. Farrakhan's a hater. Farrakhan is this. Farrakhan is that. You're talking with a double standard. If I talk to black people about what white folk have done to us, that's hate. If Jews talk to the world about what the Germans did to them, that's remembering. <laughs> now look, this is not about hate. It's about making our people wise that we don't make the same mistakes that we made yesterday. I made a mistake yesterday, but I won't, by the help of God, make that same mistake again. I spoke into a storm and allowed the enemies to kill the brother. I wasn't the one that started that. I was a participant. See? Go back and pick up the papers and read. My name is never mentioned. On the assassination of Malcolm X, Louis X was just a little boy in Boston that was preaching. He was just a lovely preacher, musician, nice guy. <laughs> How the hell do I know about assassinating the whole world? But today, this little boy has grown up. The boy that was Malcolm's understudy. The boy that was the student of Elijah Muhammad is now growing up. And everywhere I go, thousands of people are coming out to hear the brother. And the government is saying, we've got to stop this man. <laughs> That's the spirit. That's the right spirit. They can stop an individual, but they can't stop a movement. If that movement is on a solid principle. So I'm going to leave you with these thoughts. I know I'm missing something that I wanted to say. I want it, well, our Lord may not want me to say it, I don't know, but I hope and pray he'll bring it back to me. Yes, I, I got that. <laughs> but there was something else that I had in mind uh, about Brother Malcolm and my life and why I'm alive. Oh, here it is. Do you remember when Jesse went to Nicaragua and Cuba? And the headlines were beating up on Jesse for going to communist Cuba and communist Nicaragua and they called him the red one, you know, he's coming back. But I had made a statement. Tom Todd, you remember attorney Tom Todd? <laughs> Sitting three feet behind me. I never said Judaism was a dirty religion or a gutter religion. That's not my language. And I'm not afraid to own up to what I say. If I say it, you ask me, did I say it? I'm man enough to tell you I said it. And we'll back it up. But if I didn't say it, I can't take the credit for that. I never said Judaism was a gutter or dirty religion. I was talking about the actions of the Israeli government. And now the world sees 
her actions as dirty against the Palestinians. She's indicted today by the human rights uh, uh, organization, uh, Amnesty International, for human rights violations. For somebody that suffered as they suffered under Hitler to do to the Palestinians what they're doing to the Palestinians, it's beyond me to know how you could have suffered that. So brothers and sisters, we got to remember, when our day comes, we who have suffered, we must never give this that we have suffered to others when we are in the position of power. So when Jesse came back, Jesse had to say publicly, Farrakhan's words, are morally reprehensible <laughs> and indefensible. <laughs> and we reject his words and all of those who are with me, I ask them to disassociate themselves from Farrakhan and his words. I didn't even know that Jesse had said this. I'm on my way to CNN to have an interview the press is packed in there. They expect me to attack the Reverend Jackson. You know, they know Negro reactions. <laughs> he hit me. I'll get him. But thanks to Allah, the Bible said when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I thought as a child because I understood as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. There are things bigger than our hurt and our pain. Yes, I was hurt by the Reverend Jackson, but he was bigger than my hurt. And the goal that he was after for our people was bigger than my hurt. So when they asked me, what do you have to say about what he said? I said, I want all of our people to unite behind the Reverend Jackson so that when he goes to the convention he will have the power of his people behind him and I backed away and as I was leaving the press said well Mr. Farrakhan it's all over ain't it? I said it's just begun I knew what I was saying and now all you got left in America on the national scene are two voices. Whereas in the 60s we had many national voices. It's narrowed all the way down now to two voices. The Reverend Jackson and Louis Farrakhan. And they're working on both of us. Poor Jesse. He may think that Mr. Bush is enamored with him. But we ought to learn a lesson from Dr. King. Because the speech that Dr. King made at the uh, Washington Monument was an innocuous speech. It was harmless. I have a dream that one day little black boys and little white girls will walk together that's a harmless speech he wasn't preaching revolution but the day after his man J. Edgar Hoover's man sent him a memo saying that Martin Luther King Jr was the most dangerous Negro in America. Why was he dangerous? Because he captured the imagination of tens of thousands of his people who hunger for liberation, who thirst for truth. And Martin Luther King from that day became the object of the United States government's scrutiny. 
if they did that to Dr. King. And Dr. King is, did not draw as many black people as Brother Farrakhan is drawing everywhere he goes. What is the same government thinking? I want you to listen. They're looking for a black person that they can use against me. They trot a few out, but they have no effect because those black people are like house niggers. The people in the field don't even know them. All of a sudden we see them on TV, supposedly talking for the field Negro. <laughs> So they say, oh man, this ain't going to work. <laughs> now, Imam Warisuddin, the son of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, my brother, yes, but going a different way. They would like to exacerbate tensions between Muslims and put us to fighting and killing each other. My brother, Hannibal Afrik, one of the most consistent black men in Chicago has always been on the case for black people and he and Haki Madhubuti and the rest of our nationalist brethren they are the powerful advocates for black liberation but they know that as they are enamored with Malcolm and are pained by the loss of Malcolm. They would like to drive a wedge in and divide the nationalists from the Muslim and then put us to fighting and killing each other. Not that they love Malcolm. But now, the other day I got a call from the Los Angeles Times. And they said, Mr. Farrakhan, we want to interview with you because there's been a resurgence of Malcolm X. What do you say about it? I said, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> I said, I'm not getting involved in that. <laughs> See, the Los Angeles Times and Emerge magazine and the Chicago newspapers and the Village Voice, all of this is controlled by the same forces. <laughs> The same forces don't have a living black man to come against me. So they rise up, my brother. And subtly now they're hinting, Farrakhan killed him. In one newspaper this week, they put it in the mouth of Malcolm's wife. I know Betty didn't say that. She's angry with me, but she didn't say that. But they don't care. The idea is stop Farrakhan. And that's why I came here today, walking right up in the middle of the trap, to spring the trap on those who planned the trap. Look, Malcolm X College, this president, we are innocent. We love the work of the man. We love the good of the man. We were inspired by the man. We were renewed by the man. We were stood up by the man. But not these. This was the enemy of Malcolm. And this is your enemy today. And they don't love no Malcolm X. And they don't love no Louis Farrakhan. And they don't love you, brother. <laughs> And so, as I leave your family, I appeal to you, let us unite. We got to put a healing bomb in the wounds of yesterday and never allow that to happen again. And like the Jews say, never again, never again. I think we as a people ought to shout back that we will not allow the government 
and its agents to put Muslim against Muslim. Even though we have differences, don't let your enemy exploit your differences. Even though there's differences between the nationalists and the Muslims, we can't let the enemy exploit those differences because we're always going to have some differences. But as mature people, we got to handle them so that we lock the door on the wicked plans of our enemies. Say with me, never again. Never again. Never again. Long live those who struggle for liberation. You can kill the flesh, but you can never kill the idea. May Allah bless you as I greet you in peace. Thank you for listening to me as long as you have. Assalamu alaikum. Mr. X, may I begin by asking you, if you will please, outline us for us the platform and policies of the Muslim organization. Well, the platform that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, our religious leader, uh, stands upon is the platform of complete freedom, justice, and equality for the 20 million black people, that, uh, or so-called Negroes, here in America. And he teaches us that uh, because of the seriousness of the condition that our people now find themselves in, that it's uh, absolutely impossible to solve our problems uh, with means other than religion. And he teaches us that the religion of Islam is the only religion that will uh, instill within our people the incentive to stand on our own feet. And instead of trying to force ourselves upon whites or force ourselves into the white society, or blame the white man for our predicament and, and constantly beg him for what he has, he says that the only way that we can uh, solve our problem is to unite together among ourselves, among our own kind, uh, clean ourselves up, rid ourselves of the evils that we've uh, become addicted to here in this society and try and uh, solve our problem ourselves.